What's poppin' low gang? It's Mark. Recently my internet broke, so I looked back at uh, some of my old videos, because I have them all saved on my hard drive for some reason. And I looked at a video that I made about two years ago, uh, about uh, the history of Nintendo consoles, uh, handhelds. And then I remembered, wait a minute, I forgot to make a home console version. So here's the home console version. Sorry for being two years late. You know, on second thought, nobody actually cares. So I guess that problem solved. Start the video! The Color TV Game Series was the first video game-esque thing that Nintendo ever made. It was developed by Nintendo in 1977, and only released in Japan. But it was also developed by Mitsubishi Electronics, of all people. It was a series of plug-and-play consoles that each came with their own built-in games, such as Space Fever, a Space Invaders clone, Sheriff, a game where you save a damsel in distress from some bandits, EVR Race, a racing game if you couldn't tell by the title of the game, and a Pong clone, which was the most successful out of all of them. The Nintendo Famicom, released in 1983, was pretty popular in Japan, with over 19 million units sold. This is when Nintendo started using interchangeable ROM cartridges as their main media format. In 1986, Nintendo made an add-on for the Famicom called the Famicom Disk System, using proprietary magnetic floppy disks rather than cartridges. Sharp later partnered up with Nintendo to make the Sharp Twin Famicom, a hybrid of the original Famicom and the Famicom Disk System, all in one box thing. Let's travel back in time a bit to North America. The year is 1983. Atari is the biggest video game company in the US. Atari decided it would be a good idea to overbloat the market with more video games. I might make a video going more into detail about this, but all you need to know is that people are no longer interested in video games. Welcome to the Video Game Crash of 93. This lasted for about two years before a titan rose from the ashes. An icon would forever change the world of video games. Now, you're playing with power! In 1985, Nintendo released the Nintendo Entertainment System in North America, completely reviving the dead market. Of course, with its challenges. See, you don't want to sell a video game console if people don't want video game consoles no more. So how did Nintendo get around this obstacle? Well, they didn't market the NES as a video game console, they marketed it as a toy, including Rob the Robot to push NES systems into the toy sections of stores. And all that hard work paid off. The NES was the best-selling item that Christmas, and sold over 34 million units in North America alone. There were different types of sets that were released, such as the Action Set, which came with the game Mario Duck Hunt and a Zapper, the Deluxe Set, which came with Rob, Gyromite, Duck Hunt, and a Zapper, the Challenge Set, which came with Mario 3, the Power Set, which came with the Power Pad, the game Mario Duck Hunt Track and Field, and a Zapper, the Super Set, which came with four controller adapter, four controllers, and the Mario Tetris World Cup uh, game thing. And finally, the NES Sports Set, which came with the NES Satellite, four controllers, and the Super Spike V-Ball and World Cup games. Some notable games released for the system are Mario Bros. 1, 2, and 3, the Mega Man games, Tetris, Double Dragon, Excite Bike, Legend of Zelda, and a lot more. The NES later had a redesign, taking more design aspects from the already released Super Nintendo, including a top-loading cartridge slot. This redesign was later dubbed the Top Loader. The NES was discontinued in 1995. The Famicom, on the other hand, lived a full eight years longer than the NES, being discontinued in 2003. The year is 1989. Sega releases the Sega Genesis to compete with the NES. It was way more powerful and had better graphics and better colors than the NES. Sega even went as far as to mock Nintendo in their Genesis Does What Nintendo commercials. This started a trend called the Console Wars, or the Bit Wars, as some people call it. Sega marketed their console as a 16-bit console, and the NES was only 8 bits. They used that fact to devise a perfect marketing strategy, marketing their Genesis as a 16-bit console. After years of competition, Nintendo finally released a 16-bit console of their own to compete with the Sega Genesis. In 1991, Nintendo released the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in North America. The Super Nintendo sold over 23 million units in North America alone. The SNES featured a top-loading design and slimmer cartridges. 
The controller added two new face buttons and two shoulder buttons. While over in Japan, Nintendo released the Super Famicom in 1990 and being discontinued in 2003. The SNES had a pretty good library of memorable games. Super Mario World, F-Zero, Star Fox, Donkey Kong Country, Yoshi's Island, Mario Paint, Mario All-Stars. You know, the classics. Well, yeah, the Genesis had more horsepower than the Super Nintendo. The SNES still had a plethora of good games. I mean, who the hell's gonna talk about James Pond, Underwater Agent? Ladies and gentlemen, feast your eyes, for this is a real thing that someone willingly put on this earth. The Super Nintendo was also Nintendo's first steps into... THE THIRD DIMENSION! Nintendo implemented a chip into certain amounts of their cartridges, called the Super FX chip, used in different games such as Star Fox, Stunt Race FX, Yoshi's Island, Doom, and FX Racer. In 1994, Nintendo made an add-on for the Super Nintendo called the Super Game Boy. The Super Game Boy was a way to play Game Boy games on your Super Nintendo, adding several color effects and even adding borders to your Game Boy games. In 1995, Nintendo made a Japan-only add-on for the Super Famicom called the Satellaview. It was an add-on that allowed players to download games via satellite. The only way to use it was to set up a special satellite dish. Sega also made a similar add-on for the Genesis called the Sega Channel. The Super Nintendo lived for about 8 years in North America before it was discontinued in 1999. This console f***ing reeks. I didn't go too much into detail about the Virtual Boy in the last video, so I thought I should just make a whole section about it here. Buckle your seatbelts, kids. We're going on a trip to 1995. Nintendo is still developing the Nintendo 64, but they don't think that they'll be able to meet their deadline and release it by Christmas that year. So they have to come up with something. They came up with the idea of virtual reality in a 3D perspective, hoping that players would be able to feel like they were actually in the game. The Virtual Boy, also known as Project VR32, was Nintendo's 32-bit console. Nintendo made an entire section about it in Nintendo Power Volume number 75, showing off the Virtual Boy in some of its games. When they released the Virtual Boy in July of 1995, let's just say it wasn't very good. The way Nintendo approached the 3D perspective was by having mirrors pointed at 45 degree angles looking at two screens on each side of the goggle things. People kept reporting headaches and eye strain after playing it for long periods of time. The controller had two D-pads for doing god knows what. The Virtual Boy was portable, but how the hell are you supposed to bring this thing around as easily as a Game Boy? Unless you have some massive pockets. Some games that were released for this console were Wario Land, Red Alarm, Mario Clash, Teleroboxer, Mario Tennis, Jack Bros, and 3D Tetris. The Virtual Boy only had 770,000 units sold within the year that it was still alive. The Virtual Boy was discontinued in 1996 because it was bad at being good. Moving on! The year is 1996. After the unholy dumpster fire we call the Virtual Boy, Nintendo released the Nintendo 64, codenamed Project Reality. The Nintendo 64, or N64, was Nintendo's first true 3D console, using polygons instead of sprites. It was originally supposed to be called Ultra 64. The Nintendo 64 launched with only two games, Super Mario 64 and Pilot Wings 64. The N64 sold over 20 million units in North America, and over 32 million units worldwide. The controller was probably the worst part of it. I don't mind the N64 controller, but I have some problems with it. First of all, the joystick is just the worst. Because of the way that the joysticks are made, it's just plastic grinding against plastic. And over time, the plastic just gets grinded away, which makes the joysticks loose. I might make a video about how to fix this issue and so, or some other alternative controllers you can use instead. My second gripe with this controller is the fact that you need to be some sort of alien from the planet Chernobyl and have three arms in order to actually grip this controller. In Japan 1999, Nintendo released an add-on for the Nintendo 64 called the 64DD. It was the exact same thing as the Famicom Disk System except it was for the N64. It took proprietary magnetic discs and was a huge flop in Japan with only 15,000 units sold. But it was an even bigger flop in North America with zero units sold. And that's just because it wasn't released in North America. 
There's only one North American N64 DD prototype in the world, and it's owned by a YouTuber called Metal Jesus Rocks. Some notable games for the N64 were Super Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Pokemon Snap, Pokemon Stadium, Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, Mario Tennis, and Hey You Pikachu! <laughs> Some games required the N64 expansion pack, which gave the N64 8 megabytes of RAM as opposed to 4 megabytes of RAM. The N64 also had a rumble pack, which gave the N64 rumble compatibility, as the name implies. Not all games support it, but some do. Let's transition to China in 2003. China had a video game ban law thingy. Don't ask me why, I don't know. All I know is that video games were banned for some reason. Nintendo partnered up with a man named Wei Yen. They created a company in Ch China called IQ. It's basically just Nintendo, but uh, in China. They released a game console called the IQ Player. What was the IQ Player, you may ask? It was literally in N64. You would be able to download games from it off the internet, similar to the Satellaview, only it's on your computer and on the internet instead of satellite. The IQ player wasn't discontinued until 2018. It lived for a whopping 15 years. The N64 only lived for 6 years, being discontinued in 2002. The Nintendo GameCube, codenamed Project Dolphin, was released in 2001. It was the first of Nintendo's consoles to use optical discs. If, by discs, you mean small baby child children discs, then yeah because their discs are quite literally very small. Don't you ever talk to me or my son ever again. An average DVD can hold up to 4.7 gigabytes of data. The tiny little itty bitty baby, tiny little little person GameCube discs could only hold up to 1.46 gigabytes of data. The GameCube had an impressive library of good games, such as Smash Melee, Mario Sunshine, Monkey Ball, Superman 2, Metroid Prime, Mario Kart Double Dash, Luigi's Mansion, Chibi Robo, and a lot of other. There's a lot of good games. The GameCube controller is probably one of Nintendo's best controllers. The analog sticks, the big A button, the fantastic triggers, the beams. An accessory was released for the GameCube called the Game Boy Player. It allowed you to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games. And don't even think about putting a Game Boy Advance video cartridge in there, because it won't work. You just got played. You thought you could pirate Shark Tale on Game Boy Advance video? I think you can, bitch. The GameCube also got a very special Japan exclusive model. The Panasonic Q, released in 2001, was a GameCube that could also play DVDs. The Panasonic Q was discontinued in 2003. The GameCube was discontinued in 2007. Whee! The Nintendo Wii, codenamed Nintendo Revolution, was released in 2006. The Wii's whole gimmick was the easy-to-use motion controls. The point of the Wii was to make a console for everybody in the family, even the people who weren't that into video games. Just look at all these buttons. I can't decipher this shit. I just need to be able to point at a screen and know what the fuck's going on. The Wii was a hit with over 101 million units sold, making it Nintendo's best-selling console that isn't a handheld, because that, that would be the DS. The Wii had backwards compatibility with GameCube. You could plug your GameCube controller on the top of it, and even insert your GameCube memory card so you still have all your saves. The Wii is Nintendo's first system to include downloadable games directly from the system. Using the Wii Shop channel, you could download exclusive games, including Rubik's Cube, Tetris, and a bunch of older games with virtual consoles such as Mario Bros, Mario 3, Tetris, Mega Man, Pokemon Snap, Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, and so on. While yes, the Wii was an okay system, I'm not a huge fan of the lineup of games that it has. A lot of it was bloatware. I mean, it had good games, but not as many as N64 or GameCube did. Like, who's actually gonna be excited about playing the Naked Brothers Band on Wii? 
Nintendo later made an add-on for the Wii Remote called the Wii Motion Plus, which they later adapted to uh, a full controller without having the tumor thing on it. In 2011, Nintendo made a cheaper version of the Wii. They called it the Wii Family Edition. They removed GameCube backwards compatibility. I am peeved. They also removed the stand, which is, now it's supposed to lay flat on its side, like it's fallen over. Another redesign they made was the Wii Mini. Not only did they remove GameCube backwards compatibility, but they removed the Wi-Fi capabilities. I guess the only thing it's good for is playing games now. I can't download stuff off the Wii Shop. I guess one thing that's good about it is you don't have to have it plugged in in order to get the games out. So that's cool, I guess. This thing feels like it was made very cheaply. The plastic is all matte, which I guess is good for, you know, when you don't want fingerprints to get all over the damn thing. But then again, it's the Wii Mini. No one gives a shit about the Wii Mini. The Wii Mini was test released in Canada in 2013. Some notable games on the Wii were Mario Kart Wii, New Super Mario Bros Wii, Smash Brawl, Mario Galaxy, Wii Sports, Wii Sports Resort, Twilight Princess, Wii Play, and some other stuff, I don't know, Google it. The Wii was discontinued in 2001. The Wii Family Edition was discontinued in 2013, and the Wii Mini was discontinued in 2017. These days the Wii is great for modding. You could add a bunch of different programs and homebrew games and emulators and a bunch of other things. After the success of the Wii, Nintendo thought to themselves, We need to make a sequel. What should we call it? And some drunk guy stands up and says, We should call it the Wii U. And somebody else stands up and says, Give that man a race. The Wii U, codename Project Cafe, was released in 2012. The Wii U's gimmick was the gamepad. It tricked people into thinking that the Wii U was going to be a portable console, when in reality, you couldn't get far enough away from the console to even reach the other side of the room. The Wii U was the first Nintendo console to support HD graphics via HDMI port. Kind of odd considering the Xbox 360 was released like two years before the Wii, and it had HDMI, but whatever. The Wii U was also the first Nintendo home console to have a built-in internet browser. It also had a TV remote function, so that's cool, I guess. Some notable games on the Wii U are Super Mario Maker, Wind Waker HD, Super Mario 3D World, Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker, Mario Kart 8, and Smash 4. The Wii U sold over 13 million units worldwide and was discontinued in 2017. During the Wii U days in 2016, Nintendo decided to make a limited release of mini NES consoles with 30 built-in games. They called it the NES Classic. A year later, in 2017, they released the SNES Classic, which was the same thing, but they included a special, never-before-seen game, the unreleased sequel to Star Fox, Star Fox 2. Very creatively named. Both systems were hackable, and modders were able to put any game they wanted on them. I can't wait to play Super Noah's Ark 3D on my Super Nintendo Classic. They ended production of the NES Classic in 2017, and the SNES Classic in 2018. After everybody started calling Nintendo a big stupid babyface for not making the Wii U portable, they revealed the Nintendo Switch, codename NX. A Wii U that could be used as a console or be played on the go. In March 2017, Nintendo released the Switch, and the Wii U immediately became irrelevant. After having literally every single good Wii U game ported to the Switch, the Wii U just died a slow and painful death. Good. The Switch has detachable controllers called Joy-Cons. They can be played sideways. Why you would want to do that, I don't know, but you can. The Switch had only had one revision so far, the Switch Lite, a handheld only version of the Switch. So far the Switch has had over 68 million units sold. And that's the end of the Nintendo console history thing. I hope you enjoyed the video, and maybe even learned something along the way. And if you didn't, then feel free to smash that dislike button and unsubscribe to my channel and call me a pee-pee brain in the comments below. Bye!